Welcome to Exploring Different Brains. I'm Dr. Hacky Reitman. We're talking today with Ron Sanderson. He's the author of the forthcoming book, A Parent's Guide to Autism, Practical Advice, Biblical Wisdom. He's also autistic and has a savant gift of amazing memory. Ron, welcome. How are you? I'm doing good. Thanks for uh, inviting me on your show today. Well, we're delighted to have you all the way from Michigan. Why don't you introduce yourself to our viewers and our uh, listeners? My name's Ron Sanderson, and I have autism. And my development began normal, and in 18 months, I hit the autism time clock. It goes tick, tick, and then I lost my ability to have eye contact. I also lost my ability to say words that I had previously learned. I said my first word in nine months, which was mommy, and then at 18 months, I lost the ability even to say mommy, and all I could say was mum, mum. And my mom knew that something was wrong at the 18-month mark, and um, had testing done. And at age seven, I was diagnosed as having autism. And at age eight, the school specialist told my parents I'd never read beyond a seventh grade level, I'd never excel in sports, and I'd never get married or have any meaningful relationships. And my mom was determined to prove the experts wrong. And she took, or the school wanted to diagnose me before I was diagnosed as autism, as emotionally impaired. And my mom said, it's not emotional, it's neurological. And then when the testing was done at Henry Ford Hospital in 1983, when I was eight years old, it came back that it was autism. Wow, quite a story. I, I like your mom. I like people who want to beat the odds, you know? That's, mm -hmm. that's how we do it. How did you get into running track? And I ask that because my daughter, Rebecca, who also has Asperger's, um, she became all county and uh, cross country and track and running and really used to love that. Tell me how you got into it. The way I got involved in track is my parents always worked with my special interest. From kindergarten all the way to sixth grade, my special interest was prairie dogs. And everywhere I went, I'd carry prairie pup, who I have here today. Everywhere I went, prairie pup went with me. And then in sixth grade, they um, officially expelled prairie pup from the public school system. And in sixth, day, sixth grade, my sport became baseball. I ate and breathed baseball every day. That was all I did. That I was fully focused on it. And then when I tried out for the baseball team in the eighth grade, the Hart Middle School team, I knew that I was going to make the team. I was the second best player trying out for the team. And then came the day when they put the, the results from the tryout. And I looked on the, the, the tryout list and I didn't make the team. I started crying. And the coach came over and he patted me on the back and he said, son, you're a great baseball player, but what you don't realize is you're the fastest runner in this school and that someday you'll get full ride for track and cross country if you keep with running. And that was when um, I decided I was gonna run track. And I tried out for the track team, made the track team in middle school, set three school records. And then from there, when I got into high school, my first two years, I did pretty good in track, but not awesome. In my junior year, my relay team, the 3200 relay, which runs a half a mile, finished 12th in the state of Michigan. Wow. And then on the way back from the track meet, Nate Clay, who ran for Minnesota when he got in college and won the Big Ten and could run a mile under four minutes in college, looked at Coach Bud and he said, next year we'd be the fastest relay in the state of Michigan, but we won't have Ron Sanderson on our track team. And right then I heard in my heart, I'm going to provide a way for you to run. And I knew it was a voice that was greater than myself, which I believe was the voice of God. And I told the track coach, I said, next year I'm going to be on the track team, even though I'm past the age limit of the Michigan High School Athletic Association. And Coach Bud looked at me and laughed and said, in the last 20 years, no one's been able to compete past the age limit in high school sports. And my parents called every lawyer trying to um, get one to take my case. 
and they said it cost forty thousand dollars, which my parents were unable to afford. And coming into my senior year that summer, I ran five hundred miles, believing that somehow I'd be able to compete on the track team and somehow be able to um, set the school record and be one of the fastest 3,200 relay teams in the state of Michigan. And I came back from a five mile run and when I got the newspaper, there on the front page of the newspaper was a young adult named Craig Stanley, who was also born in 1975 May, was a track and cross country runner and had learning disabilities and was past the age limit to compete. And it was in the Detroit News. So my parents contacted his parents we got together in advocacy, and um, we decided to do one more newspaper article for the Detroit News. And his parents shared, too, that they called lawyers and no one would take the case. And I said, we're going to run. I don't know how. And during this time period, I decided to get water baptized and show my commitment to faith. And the day I got water baptized, when I came out of the water on a Sunday, the pastor looked at me and he said, I normally don't give someone a word that I feel is for them, but this word's for you. Joel 2.25, I repay the years of the locusts eaten. The great locusts, the young locusts, the other locusts, the great army I sent among you. And he said, there's an army of locusts in your past that eaten up a lot of the good things that you could have had with your disability. But today that's going to change. And when I got home from being water baptized, the answering machine was blinking red. And when I pressed the answering machine, it was a young lawyer saying, I want to take your case pro bono. I believe that under the Americans Disability Act, you will win your case and be able to accomplish going to college and accomplish many other things that your learning disability may have been, hampered you from accomplishing. So my parents and I went out there, met with Rick Lando, and he took our case. It's interesting, one of the things he said to me when he took my case, I never told him that one of my special interests was baseball four years ago. He looked at me and said, son, if your sport was baseball, you'd be watching from the stands this year because four years ago in Kentucky, there was a young adult who sued to play baseball and they said it was a contact sport under the American disability and he lost. So if your sport was baseball, you wouldn't be competing this year in sports. And since track and field was a non-contact sport, I was able to win my case. My relay team finished the second fastest time in the state of Michigan. And I went on to get full ride to Rochester College, which was then Michigan Christian College to run track and cross country. You know, Ron, you're, you're obviously a man of great faith and of great memory. This is a natural segue into You've just given us a great illustration of your faith. And now, how did the faith and the memory get together? The way my memory became so great was um, when I was diagnosed um, as having autism, the school systems at first wanted to diagnose me as emotionally impaired. And my, like I said earlier, my mom said it's not emotional, but neurological. And when she saw the, set, the special ed, classroom setting for the emotionally impaired, all the kids were basically being babysat. They weren't using their gifts, they weren't using their talents. And my mom was a woman of great faith too. And um, she believed Proverbs 22, 29. Do you see a man skilled in his labor? He was served before kings, not obscure men. And she knew I had this great gift. And she knew if she could develop it, I'd serve before great men and not obscure men. And she knew if she had me in that classroom setting where I was basically being babysat, all the best I could do would pump gas. She was determined to take my great gift of memory that she saw that I had that ability, develop it, and then enable me to use that to develop other social skills and other abilities. And the main way she did it was quitting her job as an art teacher and working full time doing pre-ABA therapy with art to teach me things. And she used Prairie Pup as a main way of teaching. And she'd write stories that I dictated. And I draw the pictures for the story beginning from age five, all the way till age about 12. And by developing that gift, 
and drawing Prairie Pup for the Detroit Art Poster Contest, I end up winning the Detroit Art Contest for Oakland County, Detroit Edison, and I got to meet Isaiah Thomas. And then through developing art, I, it also developed my memory to be able to blossom and be able to memorize great amounts of things. And my special interest, my junior year of high school, was both track and memorizing scriptures. In one year, I memorized over 2,000 scriptures. Now tell me about your family. My family, my dad was an architect, my mom was a professional artist, and then I have a brother, Chuck, who's also on the autism spectrum. He has Asperger's, and his special interest is Star Wars, so he was all excited with the new movie coming out. And when the new movie came out, he was one of the first people to see it. And he has over a $40,000 Star Wars collection in his basement where he's made all the models from the original movies for these six-inch figures. And then he has them all in glass casings with a lock because he has four kids, so he doesn't want them getting into his Star Wars collection. Now, are you married also? I'm married, yep. I've been married now three years. My famous joke is I got married on... December 7th, the anniversary of Pearl Harbor, I told my in-laws, since I have autism, I'm coming in like a kamikaze. And also <laughs> kamikaze means whirlwind of fire. And as a preacher, I'm a whirlwind of fire sometimes. We feel that a lot of the institutions would gladly embrace neurodiversity if they were educated in it. So um, I'm very proud to be giving the first ever neurodiversity lectures to the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. And we believe that, you know, like police would be glad to, if they were educated, teachers would be glad. Doctors, I mean, I'm an MD uh, and uh, I got uh, no, you know, no training in this, Ron. You know, I just, I, I didn't. Let us talk, because you've opened a new dimension here to me, because I really hadn't thought of it, the religious institutions, you know, uh, religious organizations, religious institutions. Do you feel that they are properly aware of neurodiversity? And if not, how would you go about spreading the word? I think that a lot of the churches don't fully understand autism and also the ability and the gifts that we can provide for the church and also for ministry and seeing the world in a different way. And um, growing up working in the, the church, my first four years after I got done with my Master of Divinity, I worked in a church as a youth pastor, and a lot of people saw me as being different. Most people would be real warm and friendly as a pastor, go up and shake your hand and um, look you in the eye, but I had difficulty during that time being able to look people in the eyes due to autism. And also, a lot of times I'd seem aloof, um, unaware of my surroundings, unaware of things that are going on, and people would take that as me being uninterested in them rather than being neurologically wired different and having to think more on um, the, the environment going on around me. I like to joke when I speak at places to describe how my mind is different than other people. And today I got a simple illustration that everywhere I go, I use this illustration. Most people are like bottled water. Bottled water, there's not much going on here. You can shake it up, you can stir it up, and nothing's gonna really happen when you stir up bottled water. You can open it up, and, but I'm more like Mountain Dew that's carbonated and has a lot of sugar in it. You start shaking it up, you start moving it around. You don't want to open up the dew. I say, if you open up the dew, you're going to get the honey badger. <laughs> and then the, the video for the honey badger says, the honey badger, you don't want to mess with him. And I'm more like the Mountain Dew, and a lot of people have trouble understanding the reason I do the things that I do when I'm neurologically wired different. Tell us about your book. Parents' Guide to Autism, Practical Advice and Biblical Wisdom. I wrote this book because I realized that there's a lot of parents out there who feel hopeless. 
Christine Barnett, who um, wrote the foreword for my book. Her son, Jacob Barnett, also has a photographic memory and, and a great ability. He's 16 years old and he's already has his PhD from a college in Toronto. And, and um, she, when she wrote the foreword, she described it best. She said the word can't. Everyone uses the word can't. Ron can't read beyond the seventh grade level. Ron can't be able to develop relationship. And she got the same response with her son. And now he has a PhD at age 16. And she said, we need to change it to can't. And she, her whole motto was find a spark in people. And when I read her book, The Spark, I realized this is my mom. It sounds just like a book my mom would write about me because she saw that spark in me. She developed that spark in me. And I decided I wanted to write a book, not just sharing my testimony, but telling how do you develop that spark? How do you take that gift and develop it so that the child doesn't serve before obscure men working in the library or just hanging out in the library, but actually has a great gift that they're able to use and develop and be able to serve before kings. In, in my own life, I've been able to serve before many well-known people. I got to speak in front of 6,500 people in Columbus, Ohio at Rob Parsley's church. And I've been able to um, speak on Richard Roberts' show and share my testimony. I've been on CNN and I've been on countless TV shows sharing my testimony, my senior year of high school, I was on every news station in Michigan sharing about my running. And I haven't served before obscure men, but before kings. And it was all because of what my mom did with developing my gifts. Well, you're, you're inspiring a lot of people. You're inspiring a lot of people, Ron, and it's, it's wonderful. Now, Thanks. What, what would you tell parents who maybe are a little bit down in the dumps about their their kid? What I tell parents is never limit potential. Realize that your kid has great gifts and that as you develop those gifts, and as you work and enter into their world, then you're able to bring them out into your world. And the key to autism is to um, be able to realize that you can't always bring an autistic kid into your world, but you can always enter their world. If your kid's interested in trains, spend time with them looking at trains and developing that gift and interest in trains, but then use the interest in trains to develop other interests such as math and English and science and, and create an environment where the child feels safe to come out of their world and safe to express themselves and um, be able to learn. That's very well said. The need to connect before your first instinct is to stop doing that and stop doing that and do what we all do. One size fits all. Well, one size does not fit all. And uh, your theory and recommendation to first connect and then harness that hyper interest for positive things is, uh, is the way we need to go. Now, when is your book coming out? My book comes out April 5th of this year. And how can people buy that book when it comes out? When it comes out, you can get it at Barnes and Noble and also on Amazon. Right now, you can pre-order my book on Amazon and also on Barnes & Noble. Now, what advice directly would you have for somebody who is on the spectrum themselves? What I'd recommend for someone on the spectrum is read everything you can read and never give up. Says in, uh, or Charles Spurgeon, a famous preacher said, by perseverance, the snail made it on the ark. And even if you're very slow in developing your gifts, even if you're very slow in being able to um, articulate social relationship, if you start moving in that direction, there's going to be momentum. And the, and the more you learn, the more you educate yourself, the more you like that snail moving, sooner or later you're going to accomplish something great like the snail being on the ark and us having the snail today. <laughs> Ron. Um, let's go back to your analogy about the bottle of water versus the bottle of Mountain Dew, okay? Would you say that that analogy holds for avoiding a meltdown 
by harnessing, by alleviating the anxiety as you see it coming, as you see those bubbles start to come up, or is there an analogy there in your mind? Yeah, I think that part of it is that realize what makes you do to do. They used to have that commercial where the person jumping off the bridge and they got the, the harness on them, the bungee cord, and, they, and then they have the do and they say, I'm doing the do. But there's certain things that um, where potential energy becomes kinetic, where it starts falling. And the word realize um, what are the potential things that can cause a meltdown? And, and as they're building up, as potential energy builds up, it's sooner or later going to become kinetic energy. And learn what your um, potential for meltdowns are and try to avoid those situations. For me, my big um, meltdowns were caused by sensory issues. When I was in Cub Scout in third grade, one day I had a hat on and they had a puppet, a clown with a puppet on, and the puppet grabbed my hat and placed its hand on my head. And I remember I ripped that puppet off and started beating the clown. It looked like Homie D. Clown from In Living Color. And then I ran out of there. But see, that sensation of someone touching my head and then taking the hat off and putting it on another kid's head created that meltdown. So I think that as you get older, if you can realize the things that are going to cause a meltdown, another thing that causes big meltdowns for me is um, bass. There's that song, it's all about the bass, the bass. Not with me. You give me the bass, you're going to get this, and you're going to get a honey badger showing up at your house. So with me, I hate bass. And in college, that was the biggest challenge I had was living in the dorm, and you'd have people with doom, doom, and the whole walls would be shaking. I'd be coming down there shaking, ready to release a can of whip. <laughs> You know, you're, um, you're a very busy guy. You're working very hard. You're speaking. You're writing books. You're a pastor. What other jobs do you have? I work full-time at Havenwick Hospital as a psychiatric care specialist, which is basically a nurse's tech, but also a counselor for people who have um, addiction issues and who have addictions with psych. I also work on um, which I've been doing for 13 years as a professor of theology of Greek and um, church history. And I also travel about one day a week speaking at churches, speaking at autism centers, and speaking at schools and other places, sharing my testimony of autism, sharing on different issues with autism and how to address them and how to create inclusion. Now, if our viewers and listeners want to find out more about you and learn more or get in touch with you, how do they do it, Ron? They can go to spectruminclusion.com. And the reason I chose the title Spectrum Inclusion is everyone on the, with autism is a different place in their walk with autism. Some people are high functioning, some people are pre-verbal, and some are struggling at the lower end, trying to just develop those skills. And my whole goal is to help people move up the spectrum and also to be included in activities such as religious activity, such as school activities. Because I know how it felt my senior year of high school to be told, you're not going to be able to compete on the track team because you're past the age limit and you were held back in kindergarten because of autism. And I want to make sure that no one else ever has to experience being kicked out or not accepted because of their neurological diversity. Yeah. Do you agree with me or disagree? See, I'm starting to see things on an overall spectrum, not just an autism spectrum, but that we're all on a spectrum and many of the characteristics you just described overlap into other areas, you know, dyslexia, OCD, ADHD, um, PTSD, um, so forth. Do you see it in your brain that way? Or, you know, when you look at the whole thing, or do you see autism and Asperger's as kind of a separate thing? How do you see it? I see um, autism as being um, a spectrum. Like you said, everyone's on the spectrum, but some 
there's debilitating effects from being farther up on the spectrum or farther down on the spectrum. And I think that that's different. There's a quote from um, a famous writer, Newberg, who said, um, no person is totally autistic and no person is not at all autistic. Even God is a little autistic because the planet's in. <laughs> and I think that's uh, the best way of expressing it. Gerald Newberg, he said that. Funny. Um, do you have, tell us about your book. Tell us what's in your book. Tell us the name of the book and what's in the book. We know my, why you wrote it, but tell us what's in it. My book is titled, A Parent's Guide to Autism, Practical Advice, Biblical Wisdom. And my book begins by giving you an understanding of autism. How is autism unique? What causes autism or what are the contributing factors? We don't know exactly what causes it, but we know there's contributing factors. And then it looks at, too, how do you build a kid's self-esteem? Parenting, how do you develop the gift? How do you get your child from where he's at to where you want him to be? Graduating from college, having meaningful relationships. And if you notice from me talking, there's still areas where I've, I have quirks, autism quirks. One is I say TH and L is wrong a lot of times because I say that I'm wired different and I don't have all the speech wiring that other people have, but I also have neurological wiring for memory that storage space and bandwidth that a lot of people don't have that kind of bandwidth with memory. And it takes away sometimes with me saying certain words and I have to watch those words. It's not intuitive for me to put my um, tongue between my teeth when I say um, brother. So I'll say it sometimes lazily when I speak. And um, my book teaches parents how to look at those areas, how to um, also bullying. One of the things that I experienced hardcore with having autism is bullying. And I'd like to share a funny story. People always ask me, what is it like to have autism? And I share this story in my book. I said, it's like the unfortunate seal named Sally. And I got Sally the seal here. And in 1989, XN Vildez hired an alcoholic to take their, their um, boat out with 53 million gallons of oil the tanker had. And it hit an iceberg and within three days, 11 million gallons of oil was contaminating Alaska. And they spent $2 billion cleaning up the water, cleaning up the environment. But then they realized they forgot one major factor, the wildlife. So what they decided to do, they took Sally and they spent $10,000 on one lucky seal and made her Sally the seal. And she became their mascot. Arnold Schwarzenegger said, Sally the Seal will be back. Arnold, or, um, Michael Jackson said, I really hope Sally comes to my Netter Netherland ranch and brings in all the kids. And they made a, a slide for Sally. And then came the big day when Sally was getting released in the sea. She had a water slide. She goes flying the sea. And out of nowhere comes a killer whale. Oh. And Sally the Seal, she became Sally the Meal. And many times in my life, I felt like Sally the Seal. And that's one of the things I would write in my book. I want people, or I mean, I felt like Sally the Meal, not Sally the Seal. And that's one of the things I want to see is that kids don't feel like that. That they have resources, the parents, so that kids can learn to um, be able to be boy proofed, which I have a chapter on. And they can learn the skills to be able to succeed in life. What tips can you give people on the spectrum on dating? You're married, you have a family. What tips can you give the uh, neurodiverse and their parents and caring third parties? The advice I'd give is this, is never give up. It says, um, a righteous man falls seven times, but he rises again. And that's a key to me getting married. I like to joke that, and this is a true story, is I dated over 300 women to meet one who is willing to put up with my autism quirks. And it was by not giving up, but by learning from every date something new. One of the things I learned was um, first seek to understand, then to be understood. And um, being able to listen before I just speak. And a lot of times I'd go out on dates and women would be like, you're a handsome guy, but you just need to be quiet more. And um, be interested 
but not hovering. A lot of people with autism, they're so focused on something that becomes their new special interest in dating that will lead to getting a restraining order. So <laughs> some of these simple advice I give in my chapter, my journey with autism. What are your career goals going forward? I want to be the first congressman with autism because there's a pattern that I see going on and it's a huge pattern. It's called the rule of law. When you have a set price for a set commodity, you can cut whatever you want and determine your own wages. And what we're seeing is that the reason our economy is poor, it's not a poor economy, it's a rich economy for the rich, but it's um, oppressing everyone else. And it's based on the rule of law. The government will have organizations like UHS, Universal Health Services, which I work for, they give them a set press or price for the Medicare and Medicaid, and then they cut the wages of everyone working under them, and then they don't determine their own wages. So the head of UHS, Alan B. Mel, is a company I work for, makes $20 million a year. That's out of real money. His real money comes from his 4% of $1.83 billion profit that they're making. And the average company in America only makes 4 to 5% profit. The average privatized company that gets money from the government making 20 to 25 percent profit. And that we have this lobbying going on, which is creating an environment where for every dollar a company lobbies, it costs taxpayers $350 in expenses of, of things costing more than they normally cost. Airplanes are a perfect example. Right now, to go to Florida and back, it's over $600 where the price should be going down because the price of gas is only a dollar forty eight here, where when it was three ten, the price was lower for the plane ticket. And again you have the, the airplane companies lobbying big time. So my goal is in um, lobbying, what I like to say is what does Jerusalem have to do with Athens and what does K Street have to do with the roads of America, meaning the average road. And what that quote is, um, Tertullian, is Jerusalem was a religious center of the world, and Athens was a philosopher center of the world, and K Street is where the lobbying is, and the street where you live on, why should we be impacted by this lobbying when we're a government of the people for the people? So I'm going to become the first congressman with autism, and I'm going to show up in a honey badger outfit, and Jesus cleansed the temple, and I'm going to cleanse K Street or North Street where all the lobbying's going on, and people will file because it just takes one person to stand up, and then everyone else will file like dominoes. Well, Ron, I want to tell you this has been a privilege and a pleasure to talk to you. I learned a lot today, a lot, and uh, you certainly are a unique human being, and I'm looking forward to reading the book, and I look forward to talking to you again and keeping in touch and. Over here at differentbrains.com, we want to help mainstream the positive messages such as you're giving here. All right. Um, thanks again, Ron. Thanks. Take care. Once more, tell the people the name of your book, how they can purchase it, and how to get in touch with you. Again, my name's Ron Sanderson. The name of my book is A Parent's Guide to Autism, Practical Advice, Biblical Wisdom, and then you can get pre-order the book on Amazon. And then my website is spectruminclusion.com. And I just want to end on one quote that I keep thinking about. Our play of today becomes our technology of tomorrow. So don't just get your kids in therapy, but get them involved in life. Get them involved in every asset of life and let them enjoy life. And don't think your kid has to be like you for them to enjoy life. Let them enjoy life in the unique way that they were neurologically wired and that their play will develop into social skills, their play will develop into developing relationships, academics, and maybe even some new technology that we don't know about today. Maybe there'll be a flying car someday because of some kid who was pre-verbal and the parents worked with him like my parents did. Like, Jacob's parents did, and now they're inventing things because of their play. Well, thank you very much, Ron. We've had the privilege today of talking to Ron Sanderson, the author of the forthcoming book, A Parent's Guide to Autism, Practical Advice, Biblical Wisdom. For more information, visit us at differentbrains.com.